Hello and welcome. You've made the right decision. You've chosen to listen to my droning, monotone voice. For that, I applaud your common sense and good taste. Now, if you could only replace the visuals and stare at a picture of my old balls for two hours, then this movie would be improved greatly. This movie is like a cancer that keeps killing you after you're dead. Like you're in heaven and you're on a cloud. And then Jesus comes up onto your cloud and is like, I'm so sorry, the test results have come back positive. Cancer has come back. Why would anyone want to watch this movie again ever? Especially in 3D. I'm just more baffled by these movies and, and like how the content of them and how they got made and all that. So Qui-Gon Jinn and Anakin are attacking the bridge of the Federation starship. What would I do if I was in their situation? Other than kill myself. Find a communications port and I would send a message to the bridge and just say, You know, Nemoidians, I know you attacked us with battle droids and tried to gas us to death, but listen. We can totally kick all your fucking asses, but we're not going to. You know, I would wave like a white flag and say, listen, let's talk this out. We'll discuss it like gentlemen. Gentlemen and fishmen. Or maybe they could just disable the droid control thing that everyone knows about, including the 14-year-old queen. Or maybe Qui-Gon could make sweet, sweet love to Obi-Wan in his ventilation shaft. Or maybe have a threesome with the what's wrong with your face lady. She's got a thing in her mouth all day, what's a couple extra minutes? Hey baby, wanna see my other lightsaber? Did you get it? His other lightsaber is his penis. Did you get it? So is it weird that the first thing I thought of when I saw a Nemoidian was if they gave great blowjobs or not? They, I mean, they got like the fish mouths. I kind of pictured what the female Nemoidians would look like naked. Kind of go down and, and take a look at what, what the ladies have between their legs. Just feel up the, like the fish clit. You know, I, I would, I would, you know, dangle my worm in front of that fish. So they're running and then... You know, they start talking to Jar Jar, and Jar Jar offers them, you know, a plan. Like, why don't you come back to this capital city with me? My question is, um, why did Jar Jar want to take them there? Uh, Jar Jar's not the smartest creature in the galaxy, is he? You know, he brings Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan before Boss Nass, but he gets arrested, and they say it's time to get executed. If it wasn't for Qui-Gon saying, you know... This, this, you know, if Qui-Gon just didn't do that, then they would have executed Jar Jar. So, really, Jar Jar would probably be more motivated to just not take them there. He doesn't really care about the urgency of their mission. I could take you to the Naboo City. Just follow me. Let's, uh, let's go this way. The way that'll take 16 years to get there. The way that's the very farthest possible way away from the Gungan City. Let's go that way. So, yeah, that doesn't really make sense. I thought I had Jar Jar figured out. I thought he was, like, the tightest, best character in the film. But I guess not. So once again, the Jedi's proved that they have midichlorians instead of brain cells. Here we have a scene with so many things that don't make sense, it's mind-boggling. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan were sent to settle a dispute, right? The dispute was because there was a taxation of trade routes, and in protest, the Nemoidians blocked the Naboo planet. The Jedi then watched them land a bunch of spaceships and robots on the planet, and then they enter an occupied city to rescue the Queen for some reason. So what's the first thing they do? An all-out attack in broad daylight. Could have waited to see where they took the Queen, but instead they endangered everyone's lives in this foolish attack. Why is Darth Sidious hologram sitting at the table? Did they tell him, like, ahead of time? Like, he could have just been standing there. It looks, it looks fucking silly, him sitting at a table. Also, just a general question. Why are they continuing on with the, like, the fake queen thing at this point? Letting them in on this secret would be a wise thing to do at this point. I mean, if there was an assassination attempt, the first thing I would do is push Padme in front of the queen. And then Panaka would go, That was the queen. And I'd go, Why the fuck didn't anybody tell me? You know, I'd be like, The least important person here is this, like, this Padme. This next scene is kind of amazing. In this scene, they meet Anakin in a bit. You know, after the whole Jar Jar tries to eat 
the thing off a thing and then and then slaps it and hits Sabalba with it. Like Anakin then tells Jar Jar that Sabalba is an asshole or whatever. And then the next scene, it cuts to Obi-Wan and Panaka and they're talking about the sandstorm or how bad it is. Panaka's like, this one's going to be really bad. And it's like, what What do you know about sandstorms? You live on a, like a lush tropical planet. But then in the next scene that directly follows it, Qui-Gon and friends are suddenly following Anakin around buying shit from this old lady. Why are you helping Anakin go shopping? Is it because he's white? Hey Qui-Gon, why aren't you looking for the fucking part? Anakin's mother is a pretty indifferent lady, you know. Especially when her son brings home this weird old guy with the beard. She should say like, oh my god, Anakin, who is this? What the fuck? But she just has no reaction of any kind. I guess Tatooine is a pretty safe place. It's not known for its outlaws or smugglers or gangsters or violence or slavery or anything like that. And while she's generally like worried and, and kind of upset that Anakin does a pod race, she just lets him do it. But then at the end when the weird man in a beard takes her son away, she's just kind of like, Oh well, this path is laid out before you. What kind of mother lets her little kid leave with strangers? Oh, I guess it was the will of the force. Uh, like she knew it was his destiny to go off into the galaxy. I don't know, it just seems a little weird. Hey, it's me! Wake the fuck up! Did you know I had a stroke? Yeah, it's true. You know, half of my brain stopped working. The half that actually liked the Phantom Menace. So it means I have some problems. Oh, that's a good question. Are you here to free the slaves, Qui-Gon? No, actually, we're, we're in the process of settling a tax dispute. Oh. No, The Phantom Menace is a fine film. It's a fine movie. Roger Ebert gave it four stars. Then Roger Ebert got face cancer. He's a great guy and a great film critic. Some people think I'm a film critic. So this is the first time when the confusing bet comes into play, when Anakin tells Qui-Gon that he's got a busted old pod racer, and that Qui-Gon can pretend it's his so that he can enter him into the race. I guess Watto wouldn't think anything was weird about that at all. You know that these off-worlders from the Republic who have this shiny silver spaceship would also own their own dirty pod racer. And they suggest that that kid that's a slave for Watto, who has raced pods before, probably that very one, be their racer in the bet. And yeah, nothing odd there. No red flags or anything. Isn't it kind of weird that Anakin has his own pod anyways? Like, did he build it from spare part? So here we have this huge event on Tatooine, the pod races. People and aliens and creatures from far and wide come to watch all these racists compete against each other. I wonder if George Lucas put the sequence in the film because he's a huge racist. If I had any money, I would buy a super fast, expensive car and be a huge racist too, just like George Lucas. What? What do you mean I'm using the wrong word? What? Well, get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. Let's talk about pod racing, shall we? Now, I don't mind the whole pod racing idea. It's a fine thing to have some kind of fast-paced action scene in a Star Wars film. It's like the speeder bike chase in Return of the Jedi. It was completely pointless, you know? They look like they have fun death racing. The pod racing sequence could have been like a cool, dark space version of a chariot race. Chariots of fire! Like these poor, dirty aliens are racing for food out of desperation, or are forced into it in one way or the other. I mean, most of them do die horribly in the race. There's an infinite number of ways to write this whole sequence better. Wait, hold on, let's talk about this part right here. Because I didn't know these pod racers were capable of flight. But technically, when Anakin shoots up into the sky, he really should come crashing down to his death. And don't even say they have less gravity on Tatooine or whatever, you fucking assholes. I'm right. Wait, hold on, my cats are causing a ruckus. 
So Qui-Gon breaks this poor businessman who's just trying to make his way in the universe. Poor Watto. Must take a lot of energy having to fly around all the day in his little wings. Now Qui-Gon takes this poor mother's only child away from her because he has to be trained. Like they don't have enough Jedis already. Anakin says it's what he always wanted to do. What? Since when? I mean, he did say he had a dream once where he was a Jedi and he came back and freed all the slaves, but so what? I've had weird dreams too. I had a dream once where I ran a porno bakery. But that doesn't mean that's what I want to do. So I guess it's good that the mother let him run off with the weird man with the beard. So in this scene, Anakin says goodbye to his dear mother. Why are they running? Anakin said he was tired and wanted to take a break, so it's not like they saw Darth Maul and were running away from him. Look out, it's the Space Ninja! Why is there suddenly a sense of urgency when before there was none at all? Maybe Qui-Gon has to go potty. So again, all this leads back to my anything goes policies towards, well, everything. They're attacked by battle droids and now they're suddenly like completely vested in the Queen's problems. Even following her back to Naboo to solve her problems by force. Why did the Jedis go back with her again? Here are some more stretches in logic and general assumptions by even more characters. When you stop and think about things, nothing makes sense even more. If that's even possible. So the very first and most recent appearance of this mystery Sith character was on Tatooine when he attacked Qui-Gon. Now remember, Qui-Gon is not aware at all about Lord Sidious. The audience knows, but he doesn't know. In fact, when he got on that ship in the beginning, he said he didn't sense anything odd. As far as he's concerned, this is all still a tax dispute thing that got out of control. So then this guy in black robes leaps out of the air and attacks Qui-Gon. And he makes the assumption that this guy was after the Queen. Why did you think that? Or he could have just ran inside the ship and started just murdering everyone. When you have the surprise advantage, why would you attack the experienced guy with the laser sword first? Also, the Sith are like the Yang to the Yin as far as the Jedis go, right? They're like the opposite of them? Let's not forget that Qui-Gon just discovered this little boy who is with him right now who has more midichlorians than Yoda. And he's also supposed to be the fucking chosen one. And Qui-Gon doesn't even mention the idea that maybe this guy was trying to kill him. I mean, he does try to run him over with the speeder. But no, he's probably going after Queen Amidala because almost no evidence points to that. Then based only on the hypothesis that Qui-Gon thinks that this guy may have been after the Queen. The only information they have is that a weird guy trained in the Jedi arts attacked them on Tatooine. The Jedi Council thinks that Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan should go back to Naboo to discover the mystery of his attacker. Um, how do any of you know that Darth Maul is going to be on Naboo? Did you all read the script? Back to the Phantom Menace. So what was your whole plan? Can you help clarify this to me and the audience? Yes. I created the crisis on Naboo. In order to get myself elected Chancellor, you see, I was the Phantom Menace. So everybody arrives at Coruscant, the planet that's a giant city. Or is it a giant city that's a planet? Oh my god, my head hurts. You know, Queen Amidala picked the most inappropriate time to reveal herself as the decoy. I mean, I guess it was meant like in the movie to show that she was willing to expose herself and be truthful to the Gungans or whatever. But how did this all play out ahead of time? Was she really expecting the decoy to handle this important negotiation all by herself? If that's the case, then why do they even have a queen? Just have a bunch of decoys. The decoy should just be something like you use when you're in a public setting and then you think there might be like an assassination attempt or something. The decoy shouldn't negotiate on behalf of the queen. So they didn't ask you who you were or why all this was kind of mysterious or like, did they ask to meet in person and what did you say then? I told them this was the only way I could communicate with them and they were okay with that. Why are they just standing there? 
uh, don't the robots have sensors that can find people in the woods? Like heat sensors or something? So the Gungans' plan here is to, to amass this giant army outside of the city in order to lure out the majority of the battle droid, droid forces out of the main city. And uh, I don't know, there, it doesn't look like they're anywhere near the city, but the point of it was to get rid of all the the, of the majority of the troops from inside the city so that Panaka and and Padme and all the, all the soldiers and stuff could storm the city and get into the to the main hangar, the main hangar, the throne room. So here comes the duel of the fates, or as I call it, guys fighting on a Star Wars set. Now this fight scene is actually pretty neat from a visual perspective. One of the better things to come out of this movie. And I'll agree to that to a certain point. It's visually neat, it's well staged, well choreographed and shot and so on. But my old brain just keeps grasping for some kind of meaning, both emotional and logical. The Gungans are motivated to use all their military resources for what reason? Because the Queen gave this barely inspiring, unmotivated, monotone speech and then everybody kneeled before Boss Nass? Is that why? Number one, I don't understand why Boss Ness hates the Naboo in the first place. A little backstory would help. All he says is, They are thinking they so smarty. Maybe they should have planned out the whole Darth Maul thing a little more. Well, that's it for Qui-Gon. I guess we should call him Qui-Gon. Woody Allen once said 90% of success is showing up. I guess not in Qui-Gon's case, eh? Well, I guess that's the end of the movie. They have a backwards political system, no army, no power in the Senate, poor relations with the frog creatures in the lake, they get invaded and can't defend themselves. So who organized this whole carefully choreographed event? Did someone just say, eh, everybody just show up and we'll see what happens. How did the Naboo manage to organize this whole festival with the anything goes policy? Again, I gotta stress, you know, I'm not, I'm not someone that, that, that is really upset. You know, I don't feel betrayed or, or I'm not like, you know, George Lucas ruined Star Wars. And I don't really give a flying fuck. I'm just more baffled by these movies and, and like how the content of them and how they got made and all that. Some people say like the work of, of a genius is not understood by the general public, but but you know if, if this is the work of a genius, then then the, 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 the standards for a genius have been substantially lowered over time.